Welcome to today's presentation from FFL Consultants. Today we'll be discussing the FFL Basic Guide for Completing Form 4473. Form 4473 is also known as the Firearms Transaction Record. I'm John Bacher and I'll be your host today. Thanks for joining us. Today's training session will flow a lot better if you have your own copy of the Form 4473 to follow along with. So just put the video on pause and go ahead and grab yourself a copy. Our presentation today of the 4473 guide will present the federally mandated instructions for selling firearms in most states without restrictions or special guidelines. So check if your state has any special laws and statutes to follow. Throughout our presentation today, we will be referring to the NICS process. NICS stands for National Instant Criminal Background Check System. And if your state is listed here in green, your NICS and background checks are conducted through the FBI. If you're a red, blue, or yellow state, your background checks may be going through your state police agency and or the FBI. You may have a combination or be isolated to the state police. Either way, check with your store manager and find out where and how your background checks are completed. Before we begin, it's important to run through some common terminology that we'll be using today and that you may come across in reviewing federal and state regulations for transferring firearms. First, what's an FFL? It is a federal firearms licensee, otherwise known as a gun dealer. A transferee is a buyer or purchaser. They're the recipient of a pawn redeemed firearm. A transferee may also be the owner or person authorized to retrieve a consignment firearm. A transferor is the seller, typically the FFL, gun dealer or firearms manufacturer or distributor. Transfer is when the transferor or the gun dealer provides or sells the firearm to the transferee or the customer. IOI is the ATF's industry term for the industry operations investigator. This is the person who will show up to your place of business to do an inspection, conduct an audit, or respond to a theft investigation. And NICS. NICS is the National Instant Background Check System, and this process is managed and overseen by the FBI. A straw purchase is where an individual may enter a firearms dealer and attempt to make a purchase or does make a purchase of a firearm for somebody other than themselves and typically for someone who otherwise could not and would not be able to legally purchase a firearm due to something in the background. A consignment firearm is a firearm owned by an individual who may bring it and leave it at a firearm dealer in hopes of selling that firearm as the used firearm or antique or collection to someone through the firearms business. A pawn transaction where someone brings a firearm into a pawnbroker and uses their property uh, as collateral, in this case it would be a firearm, to obtain a short term loan. And that firearm that was pawned would typically be retrieved at a later date. A handgun is a short barreled firearm designed to be fired with only one hand. And the two most common handgun types that we will be talking about are revolvers and semi-automatic pistols. A long gun on the other hand is a firearm that is typically held with two hands to control and has a barrel length exceeding 18 inches and is also shot from the shoulder and has a shoulder stock installed. And the long guns we'll be discussing are rifles and shotguns. 
A receiver is another type of firearm, although not a fully functional firearm in its uh, state as a receiver. It does not have a stock and a barrel, but may, it may not even have a, a trigger mechanism, but it is the main component of a firearm that is used to fire the projectile uh, with an explosive charge. In this case, it would be bullets. And then there are other firearms. We will classify other firearms as those firearms that are not handguns, not long guns, and not receivers. Now we'll start to discuss the 4473 completion process. And we'll start with Section A, which is completed by the transferee or the purchaser. Section A must be filled out at the FFL premises or in the presence of the FFL or an FFL employee. And this could occur off-site, um, for instance, at a gun show. And the person completing the form must be the buyer or someone assisting the buyer who may be blind or possibly illiterate. Depending on where you work, you may be using the standard paper form, Form 4473, which is ordered from the federal government, the ATF, or you may be using an electronic software package that allows your purchaser to complete the Form 4473 using a laptop or a tablet device. For the purposes of this session, we will be referring to the paper form 4473, but all requirements are the same. All markings on the manual 4473 or the paper form must be in blue or black ink and must be legible to an ATF inspector. First thing we'll discuss is the warning that's printed on form 4473 at the top of page one. This is probably one of the most important parts of the form for both you and the buyer to understand. I do highly recommend that you read this form, especially this warning uh, in its entirety with the instructions so you clearly understand uh, what the laws are and what the penalties are. So this is important for the buyer and for you to read. Uh, it explains the laws for falsely obtaining a firearm and it also explains the penalties. So let's get started and take a look at how we complete this Form 4473. The first thing the buyer or transferee is going to have to do is complete their last name, first name, and middle name in box one. This is entered in the right order of last, first, middle. This is very important to understand and oversee as your customer is beginning to fill out the form. Entered in the right order, including suffix, and if there's no middle name, simply put the initials N, M, N in the middle name box. If any part of the name is only an initial, also note in parentheses I-O after the first or middle name, if that's the case, representing initial only. The next box is box two. This asks the transferee for the current state of residence and address. This must be the current address that the customer resides at. Where will the gun be stored? And it can be different from the photo ID that your transferee or your customer is presenting. Your customer or you must know the county of residence and be aware that county is not country. You do see this error frequently when customers are filling out a 4473 for the first time. They misread the form and they, they put USA for country versus the county they live in. And postal abbreviations are acceptable, such as RR for rural route, AVE for avenue, or DR for drive. Um, but PO boxes and mail stops are never permitted. The address your customer needs to use must be a real property location. Box three asks for the place of birth or the buyer. This is either the U.S. city and state or the foreign country. It's one or the other. They must spell out the city. The state abbreviation is acceptable. And again, they'll either have a U.S. city and state or the foreign country. Next is box four, which is pretty straightforward. 
for height, we want our buyers to include feet and inches. When designating weight, they should indicate pounds. And for box number six, which is sex or gender, uh, they should be identifying that as what they are identified as on their driver's license or other state issued ID at the time they're attempting to purchase a firearm. Box seven is asking for their birth date. And this should be in the correct order of month, day, and year. And just be alert to any international purchases as they may not be following this date sequence when first looking at the form. Box eight is asking for a social security number. This is listed as optional, but we do know that the social security number greatly assists the next process for common name holders such as Smith. And using or providing the social security number may also prevent next delays or denials. Box nine asks for a unique personal identification number, otherwise known as a UPIN. This is a great option for purchases with common last names or for folks who have had problems with past background checks before. A UPIN can prevent conflicts with others who may have a similar last name with criminal records and derogatory histories. And the UPIN, when provided, can expedite the transfer process. Next, the form is asking for ethnicity in Box 10A. And there's only two choices, Hispanic or Latino, or not Hispanic or Latino. Your buyer simply needs to select one. Box 10B now asks for a race. Please don't overthink this box. Most buyers will know their origins and ethnicity. Buyers can select more than one race. Next, we'll look at question 11. Questions 11A through 11I are what we term as disqualifiers. These questions are very important for you to know and understand, so we highly recommend that you spend time reviewing the questions along with the instructions included with the Form 4473. Please remember to avoid at all costs coaching or counseling the purchaser. When your buyer is filling out this section of the 4473, they may look to you for instruction direction, advice, or coaching. They may not understand the questions. Again, the instructions are provided with the form. Please suggest that the buyer reads through the questions slowly. Refer the buyer to the instructions. Do not try to explain and do not try to coach. FFLs must review these questions after completing. And if any disqualifiers are identified, you as the FFL can simply ask the buyer to review the answers for accuracy, but do not provide any coaching. Let's take a look at these questions one by one. The first question in section 11 is going to affirm that the buyer intends to be the rightful owner and possessor of the firearm. This question helps deter straw purchases. And this question must be answered yes to proceed with a firearm transfer. Question 11b asks the purchaser if they are under indictment for a felony or subject to imprisonment by a judge for up to a period of one year. And again, this question can only be verified through a NICS check. You should not offer any advice or opinion if asked about this question by the purchaser. You should refer the purchaser to instructions for clarification. And this question must be answered no to proceed with the transfer. And question 11C now asks the purchaser if they have ever been convicted in any court of a felony. This question can only be verified through a very thorough mixed background check by the FBI or state agency. If asked about this question, you should refer the purchaser to instructions for clarification. And this question must be answered 
no to proceed. Question 11D now asks if the purchaser is a fugitive from justice. This question can only be verified through a NICS check. Please refer the purchaser to instructions for clarification. And this question must be answered no to proceed with the firearms transfer. Question 11E is asking if the purchaser is an unlawful user of or addicted to marijuana or any other depressant or stimulant or narcotic drug or any other controlled substance. Now, this is controversial in today's states where cannabis has been legalized, but bear in mind that state legalization of marijuana disallows legal transfer of firearms and is not recognized by the federal government as a legalized controlled substance, although many states have now authorized it and legalized it for medical and recreational use. Medical marijuana cards are not acceptable forms of state-issued ID for federal firearms transferees. And if asked about this, please refer purchaser to the instructions for clarification. And this question must be answered no to proceed. Question 11F asks the buyer if they have ever been adjudicated as a mentally defective person or been committed to a mental institution. This information can only be retrieved through a NICS background verification. If asked about this, refer the purchaser to instructions for clarification. And this question must be answered no to proceed. Question 11G asks if the purchaser has ever been discharged from the armed forces under dishonorable conditions. This can only be verified through a next background check. You should refer the purchaser to instructions for clarification. And this question must be answered no to proceed. Question 11H asks if the subject is subject to a court order restraining him or her from harassing, stalking, or threatening a child or an intimate partner or child of such partner. This information would only be accessible through a NICS background check. If questioned about this in any specific way, refer your purchaser to the instructions for clarification. And this question must be answered no to proceed. Question 11i asks if this purchaser has ever been convicted in any court of a misdemeanor, crime of domestic violence. Earlier, we were asking the buyer about felony convictions. This is a misdemeanor for domestic violence. This can only be verified through a next check. If asked about this question, please refer the purchaser to instructions for clarification. And this must be answered no. Question 12a now asks about country of citizenship, and the purchaser must make one selection, either choosing the United States of America or other country. And if other country is selected, the purchaser must specify where. Question 12b now asks if the purchaser has ever renounced their United States citizenship. This is uncommon, but Renounced means an individual has declared that they have abandoned their citizenship, and this must be answered no to proceed. Question 12c will ask if the purchaser is an alien illegally or unlawfully in the United States. This can only be verified through a next background check. If you are questioned, please refer the purchaser to instructions, and this must be answered no to proceed. Questions 12D1 and 12D2 are asking about an alien being admitted to the United States under a non-immigrant visa. Well, first of all, your purchaser will know if they have a non-immigrant visa issued by the federal government. This will be verified through the next background check program. If you are questioned about it, please refer your purchaser to the instructions. Questions 12D1 may be answered with a yes or a no answer. If answered with a yes, they, they must present documentation to you 
which then must be listed in box 18C. If the buyer answered no on 12D1, then 12D2 should be marked NA. And if your buyer answered yes to this question on 12D1, then 12D2 should be marked either yes or no. Question 13 is asking if your purchaser is a resident alien in the United States. They will certainly know this if they are and have that information available. This can be checked through a NICS background check process. Refer your purchaser to instructions if they have any questions and require them to list their resident alien number in the space provided in box 13. We now come to the affidavit of certification for section A, which has been completed in its entirety by the transferee or the buyer of the firearm and ask them to pay close attention to reviewing and the statement that they are signing to paying close attention to items 11 and 12 that were answered previously. And after your transferee signs the form and dates it, check the date for accuracy, and then review all boxes in Section A for completeness. We now move to Section B, which is completed by you, the FFL. Section B is the FFL's responsibility, and this is typically completed by the person interacting with the buyer who is completing the firearms transfer. This is completed after reviewing Section A and including the buyer's signature and date, and do not proceed if questions 11 or 12 disqualifies the purchaser. Question 16 will ask what type of firearm is being transferred from you, the FFL, to the transferee, the customer. In most cases, it's one firearm, and you should indicate whether it is a handgun, a long gun, or other type of firearm. The purchaser may have multiple or several firearms being purchased. That is permissible. You may have to check more than one box in question 16. The box for other firearm includes frames, receivers, and other firearms, not a handgun or long gun. Again, review your instructions to understand the different variables for the Question 17, which is completed by you, will ask if the transfer is occurring at a location other than the address listed on the federal firearms license. In some cases, this may be an off-site gun show. Question 18 now asks about the identification being presented by the person attempting the transfer. After examining the photo ID and ensuring that it is unexpired, Make sure that it has been issued by a government agency. This does not need to be a formal driver's license, but it must contain the name, resident address, and date of birth of the person making the transfer. And bear in mind that this may not be the current address as listed in Section A for address of the transferee. Question 18b asks for a Supplemental government issued documentation if, in fact, the address on the photo ID is not the same as listed in box 2 in section A of the form. This may be applicable to military persons living in another state, or maybe someone who recently relocated and has not updated their state issued photo ID, or maybe has a second home where you are located. The supporting documentation presented must be issued by a government agency or organization. Question 18C now refers back to Section A, Question 12D, that asked about non-immigrant alien prohibition. This is a very infrequent occurrence, and it is only required if the buyer did in fact answer yes to 12D in Section A regarding being an alien with a non-immigrant visa. The FFL must review and retain a copy of the document explaining the exception, and the copy of the documentation must be attached to and filed with this Form 4473. Questions in Section 19 will pertain to the background check being completed on the transferee 
otherwise known as the mixed background check process. This must be completed prior to the transfer of the firearm. Box 19A should have the month, day, and year inserted appropriately. It must be completed when the next check is submitted, at the time it is submitted. This date may be different from the date of the buyer's certification, meaning NICS is not available. Very infrequently, NICS experiences a heavy volume that may result in delayed processing or access. Box 19B requires that the NICS or state transaction number, if provided, be documented. This is a number obtained from NICS or your state agency at the time you submit your background check program for the person purchasing the firearm. This is important for reference by ATF investigators. Box 19C is the result of the background check that was just completed. There are boxes for proceed, denied, canceled, and delayed. The background checks may be called in or transmitted electronically to FBI or your state agency. The FBI and several state agencies also allow for electronic transmittal. One of the boxes must be indicated. Only NICS or state agencies can cancel a background check. NICS cancels must be retained in a separate file folder for five years. Do not discard Form 4473s that are canceled by NICS or your state background check service provider. NICS denials must also be retained in a separate folder for five years. As we mentioned on occasion, the FBI or state agency processing your background check may cancel your background check process and the cancel box should be indicated. On occasion, there are what we call FFL cancels, where the buyer has changed their mind, decided to stop the transfer, maybe they left the store and failed to return, and may require you to not proceed with the transfer. Now, this FFL cancel may result in a proceed from the background check processing service, will it be the FBI or state agency? In this case, Cancelled should not be checked in, in the box, but rather the transfer of the firearm will not proceed. This form should not be discarded. If you processed a NICS background check, you should always retain the form. You may make a note in box 31 of the situation. Transfers not completed due to buyer issues must be retained if the next check was submitted to your state or a federal agency. Do not discard these 4473s. All other delays may include a transfer date provided by NICS. If a transfer date is provided, list that date in the space provided. When you receive a delay response from NICS or your state agency on a background check for a transferee, you will typically be given a date on which you can transfer that firearm. That's typically three days from the date of the application and excludes weekends and holidays. Keep in mind that the delays may be updated by next year's state agency prior to the expiration of that date provided. And then certain states do have stricter requirements such as waiting periods. You should become familiar with your state if you are processing background checks through the state police agency and not through NICS. All delayed background checks will result in one of the boxes in 19D being selected. The delay will either advance into a proceed, a denial, a cancel, or a transfer where no response was provided within the three business days and after the waiting period has, has expired. Indicate the appropriate box for your transfer situation and be sure to insert the date. Firearms may be transferred after the waiting period expires without communication from NICS. Again, this is for non-state specific background check services. The three day waiting period applies only to the NICS specific background check process. On occasion, you may transfer a firearm to an individual and someone from NICS or your state background check agency will call you to notify that there was an issue with the transfer. This may occur. 
It's not something to have anxiety about. If you actually transfer a firearm and are notified later by either NICS or your state background check agency, follow their instructions and pr provide the information requested. It is not the FFL's responsibility to retrieve firearms from ind individuals when the background check status has been updated to a denial or cancel. Box 19F allows the FFL the option of recording the Brady identification number of the NICS examiner that they interacted with on the background check that was processed for the transferee. This is not necessary, it is optional, but it is good reference information for your records. Box 19G allows for you to list the name of the FFL employee completing the NICS check for the transferee. This is another optional box, and it's good record keeping if you want to use it. Box 20 will only be used if you are dealing in NFA firearms, typically suppressors. Your FFL will be a Class 3 FFL license, and you will have an SOT stamp. These are used frequently, like I said, when selling suppressors. The NICS background check program is not necessary when transferring an NFA firearm where a Form 4 is present. The NFA branch has already conducted a very thorough background investigation on the person presenting the approved Form 4. If this is occurring in your location, simply check Box 20. Several states have been approved by the FBI to accept concealed carry permits as an exemption to the NICS background check program when purchasing or transferring a firearm from an FFL. If this is the situation in your state, be sure to confirm dates of issuance or expiration on the concealed carry permit and check box 21 and record the information required. Section C of 4473 will be required for all delays. This section will be completed by the transferee when they actually come and pick up their firearm after receiving a proceed determination from NICS. This section must be completed when the firearm is transferred on a date that is different than the date listed in box 15. And this section must be within 30 days of the next approval proceed date that was written in box 19A or 19D. Moving on to section D, which must be completed by the FFL or an FFL employee. Boxes 24 through 28 are related to the firearm or firearms being transferred. Box 24 must include the manufacturer and importer if different for each firearm being transferred. The model, serial number, and caliber are all to be retrieved from the frame or bar barrel of the firearm, not from a carton or container. The type in box 27 includes pistol, revolver, shotgun, receiver, frame, firearm, or other. Please do not use any other designations in box 27. Please refer to instructions for box 27 if necessary. Each firearm being transferred must be listed on a separate line. And if you have more than four firearms being purchased, use a separate piece of paper and attach it to this original form 4473. Caliber may include multi or 45 slash 410 if stamped for multiple calibers. If any information is unreadable or missing for any of the information required in boxes 24 through 28 for a firearm being transferred, list none or NSN for no serial number. Do not leave any of these boxes blank. And if more than two handguns are being purchased across any five consecutive business days by the same individual, FFLs are required to complete Form 3310.4, which is the multiple transfer or sale of handguns. And if any one individual is purchasing more than two long guns across any five consecutive day business period, and those long guns 
are being sold or transferred in the states of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, or California, and also have a caliber higher than a 22, a detachable magazine, and a semi-automatic, the FFL is required to fill out form and submit 3310.12, which is the multiple sale or transfer of select long guns. And a final best practice in this section of the form is to draw a line across any unused spaces to prevent entries by another, another employee at a later date. In box 29, the FFL employee simply writes the word that represents the number of firearms being purchased. For example, if two firearms are being purchased or transferred, Write the word two, TWO. Do not use numerical values. If you are a pawnbroker, pay special attention to box 30. Make entries specific to pawn firearms versus new firearms transfers. If a firearm being transferred on your form 4473 is related to a pawn redemption, you need to check this box and indicate which line in 24 is related to the firearm being redeemed. The pawn redemptions must include a mixed background check. And the reason for using this box and indicating which firearm is being mentioned as a pawn redemption is that pawn redemptions are excluded from the form 3310.4 and Form 3310.12 transaction process we just mentioned. The ATF has provided Box 31 for the exclusive use of the FFL. This is a great place to document phone numbers or any other details related to this firearms transfer. Box 32 is related to private party transfers and this is required in some states by law. This can also be used in any state where a private individual just simply wants to ensure they are transferring a firearm to a non-prohibited buyer in a private sale. Check this box if pertinent and read the instructions if more information is required. And box 33 is where you input your information regarding your FFL. Box 33 is required for every firearms transfer. The information can be written or rubber stamped. And the information must include your FFL name, your license address, and your FFL license number. And finally, we reach the certification that must be signed and dated by the FFL employee who is transferring the firearm to the transferee. Every employee should really spend some time reading and understand the certification. This holds the transferring employee accountable and responsible for the lawful transfer of a firearm. This section must be signed and dated at the time of the actual transfer. All canceled and denied 4473 applications must be signed by the attending FFL employee who completed Section B for the transfer in question. Because a firearm is not being transferred, box 37 should not be dated. Whether or not a firearm is transferred, all 4473s signed and dated by a transferee or a buyer must be retained and filed by the FFL. And remember, cancels and denials must be kept on file for five years. And remember, as an FFL, you never have to transfer a firearm to a purchaser just because they pass a background check or make demands. By law, FFLs are protected from discrimination and legal recourse in the management of the firearms transfer and inventory control process. When in doubt, be a holdout. As an FFL, you can reserve the right to refuse a sale or transfer to any transferee for whatever reason whatsoever. And remember to report suspicious firearm customers to your local law enforcement agency and your ATF regional office. And I'd like to say thank you from FFL Consultants for joining us today to review the basic guide to Form 4473 training. 
So don't let your training stop here. Visit us at FFLConsultants.com where you can register now for free access to this video and our other FFL training products. Join us for future training sessions discussing ATF form requirements, preventing straw purchases, and best practices to be inspection ready every day. If you want to get in touch with me, just drop me an email at jb at ffl and We hope to see you again soon.